Welcome back to Beyond the Helmet. I'm your host, Steve McGrath, and today I get to mix it up with, in my opinion, in my lifetime, one of the best fullbacks to ever do it, hands down, former All-Pro, Pro Bowl player, Mike Carney. Mike, how are you doing today, man? I'm good, Steve. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you taking the time. I, I'm doing great. You know, we're um, we're about a month out from the start of the football season, so you know, just where you are in your life now, how much do you watch? You know, are, are you big on Arizona State or the college scene more than the NFL? Uh, I mean, as you gear up, you know, what, what are your thoughts on just what you think this year will be like? What are you planning and paying attention to? You know, I've been out 11 years this year, so but I still keep close tabs on Arizona State and, you know, obviously where I play, play college at. And then, you know, I'll check out New Orleans, check out the Rams. I live out here. Southern California, and I do the uniform inspecting for the Rams. And so I'm there on home games, been doing it now. I'm going to my sixth year doing that. So, you know, I stay very close to the game. Now, I'm not going to tell you who the top guys coming out of college are going to be for the draft and all that stuff, but I do like to stay very close to the game and, and check the ticker every once in a while and just kind of see what's going on. And obviously, you know, the big name guys that are coming out and you like to see what they look like and stuff like that. But, uh, Typically, this time of year probably starts probably in the middle of June. I start getting those dreams like I'm I'm late for a meeting. I'm late for a practice. And those have been happening ever since I retired. And um, I guess you can call them old, old uh, uh, maybe PTSD for, for former players. You know, you, you wake up in a panic, you know, sweat. Like, oh, yeah, I'm in training camp. No, you're not. You're, you're at home. You're in your own bed. Um, but, yeah, so this time of year is always special for me and my family, because it is football season, whether I'm still playing and obviously now I'm not, but it's always football season. It's really exciting. My, my older son's 10 years old. He's going to be playing tackle this fall for the first time. I'm helping coach that. So, you know, the, the ball keeps rolling and, um, and college and, and NFL seasons, uh, when, whenever it's upon us, I get very, very excited for it. So if your son's going to be playing tackle for the first time, how long until you become coach Mike, or, you know, not just dad, but, but the coaching had, uh, and I got to imagine he's going to be sticking people. Like, yeah. I'm already. Yeah. Well, you, you hope so. You know, he's been learning the hard way of, um, you know, I told him there's three phases. The first phase is learning how to wear a helmet and the pain of wearing a helmet and getting used to wear a helmet. He's been having a struggle with that. And then there's the, the part of the conditioning, wearing a helmet and running around and football. There's a lot of conditioning, a lot of discipline involved and a lot of agility drills and a lot of um, technique and fundamentals and things being taught at this age, but um, very proud of the way he's been handling it. Um, we haven't gotten in pads yet. We get in pads uh, this Saturday. So we got oh, about a sixth grade day, six day acclimation process before the kids can get in the pads. So we'll see what he can do. He's a big boy. He's about 120 pounds and 10 years old. So he's probably going to be, uh, more than likely working in, in the trenches at this age where the past five years playing flag football, he's been the starting quarterback. So uh, now he's going to really find out what, what real football is. And I'm actually really excited for him to be on the offense and defensive line because he's actually going to really see what real football is, you know, play after play. Um, but yeah, the coaching hats on, I'm not the head coach and the assistant coach. Uh, it allows me to kind of still be a dad and, and not uh, get too involved with other kids. Um, so I'll be there just to kind of be, be there for support. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a dad that did it at the highest level, not living through my kid. You know, I really want him to learn and have fun and, 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 and learn it the right way. So that's a, another big reason why I joined the staff to make sure that, uh, you know, I can kind of see how the, the kids are being, being taught, make sure I can maybe add some things, you know, from my career to kind of uh, help the kids do things a little bit better, but uh, so far so good. Very cool. So I, I almost don't want to ask. I, I'm going to imagine that there's not even a fullback on your son's team. That's just not the way I'd imagine they're playing. I, I mean, is there a fullback? No, there, there is. One of the, the, the big reasons we, we uh, joined the team that we're on, the head coach is pretty much the, the founder of a Pop Warner out here. And he is like, hey, we throw the ball maybe 10% of the time. At, the, at this level, you know, it's hard to get kids in pads. Uh, to throw proper routes, you know, you know, th three step, five step, seven step drops, which, you know, seven step doesn't really exist anymore, but you know, for it's power eye, it's going to be a lot of downhill, a lot of phone booth football. So I'm really excited about that because I really, you know, as you know, Steve, the game overall has, has, you know, moved to more passing 
and less running. And as a fullback, that that to me is just like, where are we going with the game here? Uh, to me, the run game is, is where it's at. So I'm really, that's another dimension for my son. I'm very excited for him to be a part of this team because we, we're going to be running the ball and getting downhill. It, in you know, one thing that's always blown my mind is, is you know, you can look at the, the Patrick Mahomes of or, or the Aaron Rodgers. Like, there's guys that are just undeniable. Obviously, you play with, you know, Drew Brees. Correct. But the teams that run the ball are the teams that win. That's still the winning formula in the playoffs. Like, uh, at growing up in New England, like, I would watch yeah. the Patriots do whatever they had to do, get to the playoffs, and then all of a sudden, even if it wasn't running the ball, the running backs on screen passes, um, you know, just short, like the running backs were the engine that kept that offense going. Why do you think <laughs> for whatever reason, somehow the NFL forgot a lot of teams anyway, that that's sort of how you get there. I mean, Anthony Sherman is probably the only fullback. Okay. Maybe Kyle juice check it. You know, there's a very short list of guys. But yeah. Pat Ricard in Baltimore, you know, you know, there's, yeah. there's a couple guys. Yeah. You know, to me, Steve, it's, it's just, the evolution of the game, you know, it's, you know, with the concussion situation that happened over 10, you know, almost um, probably about right around 10 years ago when the cat got out of the bag about concussions, you know, the game really changed. They really kind of try to take the head out of the game. And, and, and when you're specifically playing fullback, you, you can't block nobody without using your head. And so I just think the game's evolved. The passing is where it's at. There's, you know, the big plays down the field, it, you know, tends to get more points. I'm old school. I'm, I just turned 40, but I feel like I was born in the 1950s. I, I still want to be seeing two back man blocking power run game. Um, and so I get excited when you see guys like a Pat Ricard in Baltimore, who's a big, thick guy, you know, who likes to shorten people's necks and get downhill. And, you know, you have a, you have a John Harbaugh in Baltimore's head coach who, who understands the importance of a run game. You have a Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco who, who came up under Mike Shanahan, who, who, who basically, um, you know, what was the, was the, the godfather to the, the zone running game, the zone uh, run game. Um, so, and they've always had, had a fullback in that offense. So you, you have a few teams in there, not as many as when I was playing, like you mentioned, the, the Patriots was when their they went to the Super Bowl was that when they played the Rams in the Super Bowl. I mean, they used James Devlin, what a few or four, you know, maybe maybe half a dozen to a dozen times a game. And then when they got the playoffs, man, it was like a totally different philosophy, and it worked. Uh, you wish you would see more of that, but you know, uh, you know, people say all the time they think it's going to be coming back. I don't think it will, but I, I, like you mentioned in the beginning, you know, the teams that that make it and go to the playoffs and are in in championship Sunday and are in the Super Bowl are teams that understand that they have to have to have a run game and it, and it helps to have a fullback in there it helps to have a, a guy in there that that knows how to move people out of the way definitely I mean the proof is in the pudding um but Mike I, I I wanted to jump a little bit more to your journey to make it through the NFL you know high school you're you're a stud coming out but then it, not that you didn't do well at, at Arizona State but when it comes to you know, figuring out is a fullback good or not. It's just, it's always, you got to be a film junkie. The stats aren't ever really there. You got to watch the film to see. Do you recall it? Like I, on a number of different levels, sort of like, you know, did you feel that you were doing good? Was it always just graded on, you know, did you block your guy? Were there other dimensions that were being considered? Did you ever feel that the media or other people were giving you too much or too little attention? Oh, I got, I got no attention in college. I mean, the transition, I think it probably has been probably in the last 10 years, this Pac-12 at after dark, where you now have these Pac-12 games on the national stage. Now the East Coast knows who the Pac-12 is. When I was in the Pac-12, it was called the Pac-10. We were, it was regional. No one on the East Coast or Midwest knew who, who Arizona, who I was or what, what I did. Um, so when I went to the, to the combine you know people didn't really know my game I went to East West Shrine game no one really knew who I was they heard about me but they didn't see what know what my game was and that was an advantage to me because I had a pretty good game and um, you know I didn't really worry about the stats I had one touchdown in college in four years um, you know my tape was my backbone it was not my 40 it was not my numbers of how high I could jump um, 
And so I always fell back on the tape and really how I looked at my game was how devastating my blocks were. I wanted to actually pancake you every time. That was my goal in college. That was my goal every time I played, anytime I played, you know, the, anytime I could, could hit a guy, square a guy up, I was trying to pancake him. Now it doesn't happen all the time, but uh, you know, that was definitely my goal when I played. And so I, I really coming out of ASU felt very good about my, my game, game tape. And I remember being at the combine, I think I ran a five flat 40 and then I, and on the first con, on the first 40. And then I, I, I happened to pull up, I popped my hamstring in the second one. And Tom Rathman was there who happened to be the uh, Detroit Lions running backs coach. And he's like, he's like, Mike, are you, are you worried about, you, you know, you're going to be okay. You know, your, your, your speed. I was like, I said, coach, I said, Hey man, just look at my game tape. I play a lot faster. You know, I got fullback speed, not 40 speed. So I always just relate. I'm playing football. I love football. I love football players. I was a football player. You know, you got athletes that play football. Very rarely do you find an athlete that's a football player, but I was a football player. I wasn't going to wow you with stats. I wasn't going to, um, you know, get you with my speed or any of that stuff. I was going to, but I was, if you watch my tape and you, you know, the, the Sun Devil faithful, they, you know, thank God they, they know who I am. You know, they paid attention and respected my game. And, and so I always had that as something to fall back on. Absolutely. Um, it, Tom Rath wasn't, I mean, he couldn't have been that fast. I mean, what, what is he doing? Oh, Tom he was fast. Here? I don't know. No, I, no, I, I don't think he was. It wasn't as if he was talking trash. It was just more so like, hey, do you, are you concerned about your, your times? I go, absolutely not. I mean, I, I believe I'm fast enough. And I played in, in the Pac-10 against linebackers that were much faster than I was pancaking. I was knocking their block off. You know what I mean? And so I, I just I always I just had it. I had this belief in my heart and in my mind that just turn the tape on and watch, watch me block and watch me play football. I always felt that way. And I, I remember my combine experience was a horrible experience, but I remember just in my interview process, just telling, telling the scouts, telling the coaches I that were interviewing me, he's like, please just watch my tape. Just watch my tape. I'm not going to wow you here. I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to jump off the, 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 I'm not going to jump off the paper with, with my times. And, and that's what really at the end of the day paid off for me and, and moving forward and being drafted by the saints. Now, I, I think I saw there was a quote. Did you train in college by strapping a car to your back and pulling it around? <laughs> no. It's the, it's the, it's the biggest, uh, gosh, biggest misquote journalism of, of, of my life. I used to push cars and drag sleds. So everyone, I, I don't know who, what reporter it was in high school or college that thought that I would take a car. I mean, uh, I just know I don't think there's anybody on the on planet Earth. I mean, I used to watch the World's Strongest Man back in the day because uh, I used to take a lot of that train, what they did in that uh, in those competitions, and add it to my training. But there's no way I was strapping a car to my back. But I used to push cars. I I was a huge Mike Allstott fan growing up through high school, and I heard that he used to push his Jeep at per University of Purdue. And I said, Hey, if Mike Allstott works for him, it's got to work for me. And I was always trying to find something to get me better in high school that could set me apart. And I felt like, you know what, pushing my car. So I used to take my Nissan, 91 Nissan Stanza to vacant parking lots around my, my hometown in Kent, Washington and, and grab a buddy and, and, hey, sit in the car, put it in neutral, blare some music. And I used to push my car up and down the parking lot. And that was something I did. And then it carried over into college. And thankfully, I had a, a strength coach in college that was a, a big, big, uh, strong he loved the strong man type stuff. We used to do crazy stuff. We used to, we had this old tram that used to take us to practice in college and that it broke down and we used to pull that. I used to, you know, put the harness on, on, on my waist and pull that tram around for a workout. I wouldn't go very far, maybe 10, 20, 10, 20 yards, but it was just something that, that I love to do. I love to do the, the stuff that wasn't ordinary, you know, and I always felt like that was always going to give me the advantage uh, to on the football field. You know, I always, even now, I, and I, you know, in the last, you know, 10, 10 plus years being out of the game, and I've talked to parents and kids and about training, you know, it's all about, hey, try to find something, try to find workouts that carry over to the field, you know, just sitting in the weight room doing bench and squat and, and deadlift, you know, it, it's, those things aren't, aren't always going to, they're, they're good for you, but they're not going to carry over. So those are the things I did in high school. And, you know, I, I ran with parachutes. I used to run, run with weighted, weighted, uh, 
leg weights, the Bo Jackson weighted leg weights up the hills. I did crazy stuff and I, I loved it. You know, I loved it and, and it paid off for me. Hey, I, I love that it added to the folklore uh, of, you know, who you were in, in a time before social media where you were never going to have to prove oh, it. I, I mean, word no. must have just spread like wildfire without anything to worry about. It did. Yeah, it did. Especially in my hometown, people were like, man, he, he really is your, like, people would go up to my dad. They thought my dad was pushing me to do this. My dad was telling me I was crazy. <laughs> you know, I was going to him with workout magazine saying, hey, dad, can you buy me this sled? Can you buy me this harness? Can, can you buy me these parachutes? When most kids are bringing the East Bay magazine, say, hey, can you buy me these shoes or buy me this glove or bat or baseball? Or, and my dad's like, what are you going to do? I'm going to use this stuff. This stuff's going to help me get faster. It's going to help me get quicker. It's going to help me get stronger. Okay. And, and he, he would do it. I'd even invite him out to come watch me train so I could show him that his hard earned money was being put to work, you know? So that was just, I, I was, a, I'm all, I've always, Steve, been a forward thinker and I just wanted, I didn't want to wait. I wanted to do it now. And so I was doing that in high school and it carried over to college and it really, I really do believe in heart of hearts. It, it, that's what really took me to the next level. It took me to the next level. Very cool. Uh, so I just wanted to ask a little bit about playing the position itself. You know, when you have, you know, Steven Jackson could do it all. Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Reggie Bush, extremely fast. And then obviously Deuce could, could just bull those people too. When you have different styles of guys that you're trying to block for, how hard was it for you? Did you have to adapt your style in order to accommodate guys that had different strengths or weaknesses? Or for you, was it just kind of, I'm going to hit that guy that, that shows up in the hole. It's a great question. And I, I get it. All, I used, I've gotten it a lot over the years, you know, nothing really changed. It, it just got better because these, those three names you mentioned, they had unbelievable vision. And, you know, when it came to deuce, it was just, Hey man, give him you know, all he needed was eight inches, you know, get, get, get to your guy, get on him, And deuce deuce was his, his feet. And his vision were probably the best. And he's probably – people get blown away by this when I tell them that they, everyone thinks that Drew Brees was the smartest player I, I played with. It's Deuce McAllister. You know, his ability to understand defenses in the games and what defenses were trying to do to our run game and with certain run blitzes. Uh, he was he was the, the best I've ever been around. But, no, it was – hey, man, it was just get downhill and, and let's, let's get on my hip, man. Let's roll. And, you know, Reggie was – Interesting because when his rookie year in 06, he came in, he thought that he could get in the hole and then take everything east and west and outrun people. And I used to have to get on him and say, hey, man, a four-yard run in the league is a great run. Okay, in college, at USC, you were able to get in the hole and go wherever where you wanted. and You could outrun everybody. Everybody in this league on defense can run. D linemen, linebackers, safeties, corners, everybody can run. So – you know, for him, it was a matter of just telling him to ha, trying to teach him to trust, trust the process, get downhill, stay on my hip, four yards every, you know, here and there will turn to 20 yards, 40 yards, right? You just got to keep grinding. And so um, Steven Jackson was just, he was probably, he was he's by far the angriest runner I ever played with. Angry. He ran angry. And I could literally hear his footsteps behind me when he ran. I mean, he ran hard and he really wanted to devastate you. So I, out of all three, that was one I definitely had to get out of the way because I did not want his big old size 14 cleat up my back. Um, but no, I just I just carried my same game from from high school, college to the league and just uh, just fine tune my, my skills, my blocking ability. You know, watching watching the greats ahead of me, Lorenzo Neal's, or William Henderson's, Max Strong's, Tony Richardson's, uh, those type of guys. Watching their tape, watching how they use their shoulders, their hands on certain blocks, and that's really what how I was able to get really good at what I did. And you know, those guys make it easy for you; they really do. Hey, and I mean, not only did you put yourself in the Pro Bowls with your play, I mean, Steven Jackson, I mean, the guys behind you were able to get the recognition too. So I think all around, I, I mean, there's <laughs> not to use proof is in the pudding twice in one like 30 minute section of my yeah. life, but I, I mean, it's there. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying, trying to yeah. ever say it again after this. Um, I mean, I, I did want to just talk a little bit um, 
about Sean Payton. And, you know, yeah. we've talked a lot about the, the time that you've put in to get great. But when you looked at teams, you know, just sort of bring it to more of a macro level. You know, what was it about him? And then even if you saw stuff that didn't work, because, you know, Jim Hazlitt, of course, was there. You get to yeah. the Rams that had that tough season when you first show up. When it came to being on good teams, whether it's from the coach down or it's a locker room thing, could you ever put your finger on what exactly was a necessary ingredient to get better teams versus on losing teams? You know, when it came to Sean, he came in with a chip on his shoulder. And no one really kind of knew who he was as an offensive coordinator to Bill Parcells in Dallas. So he came in with a chip on his shoulder. He really did. And he really wanted to prove himself. And what I thought he did so well is he kept the, the good core group of guys that Hazlitt had the year prior to him getting there and adding another group of guys that allowed us to mesh well together. So, you know, he kept a good dozen of us or so from the 05 year after Hazlitt got fired. And he added a Scott Vegeta, a Scott Shanley, uh, a Mark Simino. He, you know, he drafts Reggie Bush. He brings in Drew Brees. Uh, he brings in Hollis Thomas. He brings in a bunch of great football players that all had the same mindset and the same work ethic. And we just, it just was just, it just, everything came together. And he was really good. He's really good at doing that. And then you add on top his ability as a play caller. Um, and to know defenses and to break down defenses and to put you in position to be successful as an offense. That's what he did so well. And then having Drew Brees does, doesn't hurt, you know, um, with his ability and what he's able to do at the quarterback position. You know, I, I think for, for Sean, his ability to do that has continued to prove his in a pudding. You know, they went on to win the Super Bowl in 09, the year after I left, proud of those guys. You know, they were able to, get a defense along with all that stuff they had going on offense finally. And it really, it finally came together. And, um, you know, all those core guys I was with, they were there. A lot of them were there. Some of them weren't, um, you know, when I went to St. Louis, um, Steve Spagnuolo was the head coach, you know, and he, he had a hard time. He had a really hard time coming from a defensive coordinator position and becoming the head coach and have, and trying to run the whole ship. Um, he, he really struggled with that, you know, and just sometimes not all coordinators are meant to be head coaches. And, um, you know, he's been very successful as a defensive coordinator, obviously he won the Super Bowl with the Giants in, in 07. And then he's won now what a couple more with, with, the, with the Chiefs or, or has been the two and won one with the Chiefs as a defensive coordinator. So he, he, he was a guy that was better off as a coordinator versus the head coach. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's very rare to you, that you find – you know, Jim Hazlitt was a great head coach as a defensive coordinator. He was able to run the entire ship. But it's just, it's just a matter of guys coming in with their philosophy, bringing in what, you know, things that they've, uh, they liked from other coaches they've coached for. And, and then, but then also sprinkling what they like to do as well. That's why I think Mike Brable is doing so well in Tennessee. Um, that's why I believe a lot of the coaches that have left Belichick staff haven't done so well as they try to be just like Bill. So, you look at Mike Rabel, he's taking what Bill, some of the, the core principles of Bill Belichick, but then he's doing his own thing. And that's why I think he's having success. So I think that's just in, in coaching in general. You know, you have to know who you are. You got to know what your philosophy is. And then you have to sprinkle in some of the things that you've done, that you've learned from previous coaches, but also not not leave what you have. Um, and what you believe in as a, as, a, as a coach from either your playing days or from all the years you've coached prior. Yeah, and that makes a, the most sense. But that being said, if you just think about the, the coaching trajectory, right? You know, you go from that uh, quality control guy to, you know, maybe you get a room, a positional guy. I mean, it's sort of like you have to be very good at coaching players in, in the scheme and getting the technique stuff right. But to become the head coach, the set of responsibilities changes. You don't now have to also look at, you know, if you came up on the defensive side, the, now you have to be the OC too. It's you need to coach the coaches. And I, I just think that the biggest thing that's missing in a lot of these guys that make that jump is they seemingly have a tough time to your point about Steve Spagnuolo. Like they just aren't good at assuming the overall leadership role and just being a, a leader of men, not just Correct. focusing on that one, you know, football IQ part that got them there. It, it's just a, weird to me that we haven't really figured out a better way to get 
more OCs and DCs prepared to make that leap. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's, it's rare. It's rare that you see it. Um, and, you know, a lot of the great ones are leaving the game as coaches. I mean, there's a lot of new blood coming, coming up and, you know, you're hoping that they, they're learning from the right guys. And I think that, you know, you got a, like a guy, Dan Campbell left Sean Payton staff and he's now the head coach of Detroit. I think that he'll have a lot of success. A former player played for Bill Parcells, uh, you know, spent some time with Sean. I think he will be able to, make that, you know, we'll still find out. We don't know, but I think that he's a guy that will have the kind of success uh, that like a Vrabel had, because I think what he'll do is that he'll take, take pieces from everybody and then make it his own. I think that's a, that's a huge thing, you know, and you, you can't micromanage as a head coach, you know, you gotta be able to have faith and belief in the guy and the coordinators that you hire, that they're going to do their jobs and all the position coaches as well. And then you have to be, like you said, a leader of men. That, that's, that's the biggest thing you got to be as a head coach. You got to be a leader of men. And, um, you know, you can't lose a locker room in the National Football League. You lose a locker room in the National Football League, it's over. <laughs> it's over. You're not, you're not going to win. Play, players won't play for you. Now, Mike, as we start to wind down here, I want to talk to you just a little bit about you transitioning out of being the league, being in the league as an athlete. Did you, uh, after that two years in St. Louis, you know, how did you, how did this sort of come about? You know, how were you feeling? physically, mentally, you know, and then how do you navigate just, okay, what's next? It's man. It, great question. I mean, it was very hard. I, I still wanted to, I still wanted to get maybe a year or two after leaving St. Louis. We went into a lockdown or not locked. We got locked out. Uh, we had a CBA issue and um, that really hurt. It hurt for guys like me. I became a free agent and, um, you know, we got locked out. The CBA, there was a, you know, owners in our in our players union were having issues over the next collective bargaining agreement. And I knew that if if it wasn't done soon enough, that guys like myself, you know, older veterans would kind of get washed out. And that's pretty much what happened. You know, just kind of got left behind, washed out. Um, got a couple workouts in um, the fall of '11 with the Seahawks and the Atlanta Falcons, but you know, they went younger. And so um, to me, that was just kind of like, Hey, this is the business. This is the, the side I've never saw that I'm seeing. And we all go through it. We're all going to exit the game in some way or fashion. Some of us are going to be holding the trophy and walking out on top of the top of the world, like a Jerome Bettis or a Ray Lewis. Um, some of us are going to go out the way I did. Yeah. It, you, you just, no one knows what, what, what that end is going to look like. But no matter how that end is, Steve, it, it, it's always very hard to deal with. Um, you know, it's very hard for guys to just jump into something else. I mean, everyone's like family and friends when I officially said, hey, I'm done playing. So what are you going to do now? I'm like, well, what do you mean? What am I going to do now? I'm going to go climb Mount Everest. I just got done playing in the National Football League for seven years where less than 1% even get there. And the, the percent from four years or more is even less than that. What do you mean? What am I do? I'm going to sit back here and take my time, decompress, get over being depressed about my career being over. And then I'll slowly work myself into finding other things to do. It's not easy. You know, I look at a guy like a Richard Sherman, who's, you know, struggling, you know, with some mental things and emotional things. And I think that he kind of sees a little bit that maybe the end is, 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 is near for him. You know, it's, it's hard for guys to deal with. It was hard for me. You know, I, I had some days where I didn't want to leave the bedroom, I wanted to sit there in the dark room and just kind of grieve and, and soak in the, the fact that I, you know, wasn't me playing. I was one of those kids that at seven years old, my first taste of playing, having contact and playing tackle football, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And I set my sights on it from that, from that day forward. And so, at 30 years old, someone's saying you can't do it no more. No one wants to sign you. You're not good enough, or they don't want you. Are they? They're going to go younger. It's it's a that's a tough pill to swallow. It's a real tough pill to swallow. And but you know, fight or flight, you know, sink or swim. And so I had my my son that's now 10 years old. He was born. He was just a few months old when I retired. And either I can be a dad and get up on the horse and and, and get 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 back to work and and um, make the most of, of life post career or I could go a different path 
you know, and sulk in the misery and feel sorry for myself. I decided, I decided to jump on the horse and, and uh, be a great dad and find out what I was going to do, do next, you know? And so and I think in some cases, I still haven't really found out what I'm going to do next, but, but I, I am enjoying a life a lot more now, um, you know, 11 years out than I, than I was probably in the first year out. That's for sure. Oh yeah, I can imagine. And, and I'm really glad you brought up Richard Sherman. I was going to ask, cause you tweeted about it and I did me having the chance to talk to as many guys as I have. I, I mean, I've, been able to have enough conversations to really understand how ugly it can be when you get to anything resembling the end. And obviously I don't know Richard at all. So who knows, you know, what's going on. Yeah, there. I, don't, it, I don't either, you know, I don't either, yeah. but I, I, but I don't know him, but I do know him, you know, because I know some of the things that have been going on for him are things that I went through. There's that, there's that anger. There's that frustration because you don't, no one's going to tell you why. And, and, and the people that you, your, 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 your wife, your, your, your parents, people that love you and support you, who have always been there for you, they'll never really understand what it took mentally to get yourself ready every Sunday and every year to be the best at, at what you do. It's hard. It's hard to explain it. And it's hard when, it, when, when someone says it's probably going to be, it's over. It's really hard because you, you don't know if you can ever put yourself into something else with, with that same type of drive, right. That can give you that same type of satisfaction in return. Right. So I, I feel for a guy like Richard, I think there's going to be more guys. I feel for guys like an Odell Beckham when they're done. I feel for guys cause they they're such on put up on these pedestals more than I was. I mean, I was just a lonely fullback. Right. But, no one really, you know, there was not a lot of cameras on me. You know, I, I worry more, Steve, about the guys that are, that are put on a pedestal by the media. And then when it's all done, everything just f falls out from underneath them. And they, and, and, and you, you see with Richard, they, what it can happen. You know, you start to go, guys can go crazy because the cameras aren't there. Reporters aren't asking you questions about the next upcoming season. Or about you know maybe getting another Super Bowl or making another run, I mean it's devastating for guys. And so I I I feel for a Richard Sermon. I hope that he gets the, the help he needs. And you know and I tell people all the time, a lot of former players when they first retire, go see someone, go see a, a go see a counselor, go see someone that you can talk to. And you know it's such the non man thing to do, right? But it, it is the right thing to do because there's so much more in life post career that is so great that you can give that I have to do with the little, little, you know, little jobs that I've had that keep me close to the game that I've had an impact on people's lives. Um, and so I, you just hope guys like that will eventually see that light and, but they do have to go through what they're going through. You just hope it doesn't get to the level that I got to for Richard Sherman. Yeah. It's, it's like stages of grief. Well, like anything it is. It is. Uh, it is. Now, I, I really want to ask you about the, the real estate that you've gotten into, but can you first just explain what exactly the uniform inspector does? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uniform inspectors, they've been around, I mean, uh, pretty much even my whole career. I remember we had a guy walking around with a clipboard and a, and a piece of paper and he was taking down numbers and telling you if your socks were upright or you had enough white in your sock or enough, you know, if I was in New Orleans, enough black in the sock making sure your jerseys were tucked in. So that's pretty much what I do for the Rams. When they moved out here in 16, I got a call from the league office from John Running, and he just said, hey, would you be the you're, – you're, I heard you right there in town. Would you be the uniform inspector of the Rams? I'm like, absolutely. I mean, it's – you know, it's not a – it's not a year uh, – it's not a year uh, – year-round job. It's a seasonal job. It's mailbox money. I'd do it for free. But it puts me back on the NFL field, and I'm able to go around and talk to the guys and, you know – write them up, see if they're dressed properly, help them out, make sure they're not getting to get fined by the league. You know, I, I, that's the last thing I want guys to get is a fine uh, from the league office for their uniform not being worn correctly. But, yeah, that, that's pretty much what I do. I walk around pregame um, and just make sure guys are dressed the way the league wants them dressed and make sure they're wearing the right stuff that's, um, you know, they're allowed to wear, you know, logo-wise, Nike and Adidas and stuff like that. But, yeah, so that's pretty much what I do. And going to my sixth year doing it, um, you know, it just puts me right back in, in, in my sanctuary, you know, and, um, obviously I'm not strapping it up, but, 
Um, but I'm on the field and I'm, I'm able to be around the guys. So it's, it's a lot of fun and, and um, looking forward to it, doing it again this year. You ever talk a little trash to like you see Aaron Donald, just tell him like he's lucky that you're not still out there strapping it on. You know, I tell Aaron Donald, I've told him several times, buddy, you could have played in our, in our, in our era. And I, and, and, and I, when I say that, it feels like it's like 30 years ago, but it does with the, how the game is today, Steve, it feels like, you know, 30 years ago with, with how our game was. And I, I tell him, there's, I tell Aaron all the time, there's not a lot of guys like that I watched in today's game that could play, could have played 15, 20 years ago. There's not, I don't see a lot of guys that could do it. And he's one of those guys. I would have loved to have been teammates with him, love to play against him as well. He just, I, I marvel. I, when I go to Rams games, when I do the uniform job, I do the job so quickly and get it over with so that I can watch him play. Cause I love the way he plays is the way I felt I played. You know what I mean? Just pure passion, physicality, intensity. Um, and it, it's fun to watch because you don't see a lot of guys that play like that in today's game. Totally. So uh, do you mind just speaking a little bit about what would well, you to, to real estate? and? Um... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we, real estate's always kind of been a, like a side passion of mine. I just thought it was always great to be able to be like, wow, it'd be kind of cool to like own properties and, 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 you know, rent them out and, you know, create a passive income. And so, um, yeah, so I, you know, I remember I was very close to Lorenzo Neal. You know, he was kind of like my mentor, got really close to him. He's a guy that I would work out with in the off season and kind of showed me the ropes. And, you know, he was doing that. He was investing in real estate. And I thought, man, he's doing this. This is really cool. And, you know, we found an opportunity um, kind of, towards the end of my career where we were able to invest in some, in some properties in Phoenix. And, and now we've now taken those single family and moved them into multifamily and did a 1031 exchange about six years ago where we have multiple units, about eight buildings, apartment buildings. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's work, it's work dealing with tenants, but it's a lot of fun. It's, it's basically, you know, my hard earned money that I saved being put to work, but I'm the one that's managing it and overseeing it. And I've found I found a uh, you know a way to take the passion I had in football and put it into my real estate you know and and you know I uh, I I manage the properties as I will now I can't run over my tenants I can't go you know you know run an ISO on them or anything like that you know you got to have you, you got to learn how to talk to people and 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 uh, relate and and uh, you know when things go bad or something goes wrong or something breaks down that you know to you know, to level with them a little bit, but, but yeah, so real estate's always been kind of a side passion. We were able to do it. And it was really a thing that kind of bridged the gap for me from my playing career to my post playing career where I could really make the, make it a, a have a smooth transition um, into the next phase of my life. And it, and it really has been something um, that I'm very proud of because of, you know, you hear the story, Steve, of a lot of players going broke in the first two years and, not doing well with their money and buying more uh, liabilities and assets. And my whole thing was saving my money so that I could, you know, have assets, you know, to invest in and, and that could create income and money for me um, while I was done playing. And so that's fortunately why I really haven't had a full-time job since being done playing football. You know, I've been able to do the little side, side gig jobs like the uniform job and, doing the combine coaching down in San Diego during, during the combine coaching the running backs down there. And it's allowed me to be a dad and be around for a lot of stuff. So, um, but real estate, I, we love it. My wife's now, you know, it's, I got, she got her license about four years ago where she, she pretty much founded our, our, our rental business back when I was playing. And so she was taking the hard earned money that we were saving and she was the one that was investing it. And she pretty much founded it. And then I took it over and then she wanted to move on to do some more higher end things. And so, yeah, we're, we're a real estate family now. And that's pretty much uh, how, how our schedule works is around her and around what I'm doing with the properties. And, and then obviously around the kids and their sports schedules, but uh, real estate's where it's at, man. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun if it's done, if it's done right. I could not agree more. I told you I definitely have a shared interest there. Um, well, man, as we wrap this up, I just got this little thing called the gauntlet. I got a couple quick hitter questions. I just need your knee jerk sure. answer on a couple of things. Sure. What, what's most important? Number one offense or number one defense? Number one defense. 
All right. Now, you've had a lot of plays, obviously, a lot of games. Do you have a favorite football memory, anything that sticks out? Oh, my three-touchdown game versus Dallas Cowboys. Uh, Absolutely. Fair enough, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What's most important? Is it the players or is it the scheme? Players. Always players. Pre-game ritual, was there anything that you had to do on Sundays? I had to get there two hours before. I had to get out there and run around and run my sprints, do my my individual things I did to get myself warmed up. And then I had to make sure everything was like laid out perfectly. My uniform made sure everything was right. And then everything had to fit properly. I would, if it didn't fit properly, I would change pants. I would change, I would change stuff. That it had, everything had to be locked and loaded uh, for me to, to play my best. That, that sounds like you were meant to be the uniform inspector. Sounds, <laughs> sounds like. Uh, I man. never got written up. I never got written up. <laughs> I never got, I may have got a, a few of the, hey, tuck your jersey in, but I never got written up. Never got a fine. Well, man, to, to wrap this up, it's the most important question I think I can ask you. And it's just given everything you've been able to accomplish, what's the one best piece of advice that you'd like to leave this on, you know, consider, you know, toward like a, a high school age student athlete? Believe in yourself, you know, find what you're passionate about. We all go, we all go pro in something. And I was fortunate to go pro in football where you had 70,000 fans, 75,000 fans cheering for you. But I had a buddy of mine who's in the advertising business who said to me a while back, everybody goes pro in something. So find something that you love, find something that you're passionate about, and you'll be a pro in it no matter what. Well, there you have it. So, Mike, to actually close it out, where can everyone find you on social media? So Twitter, I'm at Carney44, Instagram. Uh, M Carney 44. Uh, I am on Facebook, but it's just my reg- regular family Facebook. I mean, you can send me a, a request if you want. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. And I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, I tweet here and there, Instagram here and there, but uh, that's where you can kind of keep track of me, see what, see what I'm doing. I do a lot of, a lot of this time of year, I do a lot of old football photos and stuff like that, kind of reminisce and uh show fans kind of what i looked like back in the day because we didn't like, like you mentioned earlier we didn't there was no social media you know we weren't able to we didn't have that stuff back in the day so um you know it's kind of fun to be a part of it and kind of yeah. show kind of the old memories i'm just happy you can do that to balance out the the ptsd that we started the yeah. conversation at this <laughs> right, time of right. year so you, you get the good with the bad oh man absolutely absolutely if i had i you know what though the, the ptsd i love it it's, it, it just takes me right back. I love it. I'll, I'll never, it, it, it's, it's not bad PTSD. It's good PTSD. 